We're here to honor the life of uh, a very quiet, unassuming man. A lot of you know him extremely well. Others, more recently, as a photograph, as my father in a nursing home. Either way, that doesn't diminish the person that he was and the contribution that he made to society and people around him. I've prepared a script here, and while I can't document every single living moment, that's not possible. He was not a perfect man, none of us are, but he was a very caring and soulful individual, a very private man. He was born on the 10th of July, 1935, in the town of Ptui in Slovenia. He was one of five sons to Alois and Anna Zorek. All brothers now are deceased, and he's joined them all in heaven, as I told him on the day he was passing. Petui as a town has got a population of 23,000, so it's actually quite small when you think about it. But in terms of its beauty and where it's located in Central Europe, it's, it's close to the Drava River there, and there are many underground caves, like the Janolan Caves we have here, that are just absolutely stunning. And it's, it's an area that's just rich with culture, wineries, scenery, and history. After Mirko finished his basic education, he spent some time traveling around Europe, especially around Austria and Graz. He seemed to gravitate towards there. And I can say that in 2006, when he made his last journey overseas to see his family, one of his stopovers was Graz in Austria. So there's obviously a connection there for him in his earlier days. And he told me that was his last trip. He knew that his time was nearing. Mirko came to Australia in 1956 as one of the many post-war immigrants. He arrived on the Toscana on April the 26th, 1956, spent some time in Fremantle, went to Tasmania, had some odd jobs, and after a few different locations, he settled in Sydney in 1957. It's quite a while ago. He took up residence for some time in various locations around the eastern suburbs, and I know there's some people here who have joined us today, Lynn, Mary, and William who could attest to the early days of his life here in Sydney in the eastern suburbs. It was here in Australia that Mirko met his wife, Emma Zorik. Emma was also from Slovenia in that part of the world, and they were married in this church on November the 11th, 1963. In fact, also my godparents, Peter Stra and Maria Stra, were married, I think, just about the same time in this very church many, many years ago, and I acknowledge them and Nancy their daughter is here today. Thank you. Emma and Mirko lived together in Paddington for a time. 172 Paddington Street, Paddington. Boy, was I proud of that. I went to Paddington Public School. I loved it. Everything was Paddington. <laughs> How cute, especially when you're young. You know, you take pride in where you come from. And I still do. They moved and lived very nearby in Cook Road, Centennial Park for about 30 years. Mirko's life interests were many and varied. Uh, he collected coins. He was interested in culture and the arts and politics. He collected stamps. He played golf for a while. He was a bit of a rifleman, casually speaking, but not a violent person, so please don't get the wrong impression. He enjoyed watching motorsports. He uh, enjoyed European soccer. Loved music, especially classical music, all kinds of music. Mirko was also an excellent cook. And I stated to him many times that he could have run his own restaurant because he had a flair and a taste and a knowledge for culinary delights and good cooking and good food and good wine. He could tell you anything about wine in respect of how it should be presented with food. And you'd be, you'd be sure he's 100% spot on. And any meal he cooked was not just made with love. It was made with love, care, and of an artisan who probably should have had another field, you know, in his later years rather than the industry that he took up in. In his younger days, he also had a very strong sense of sartorial eloquence. He was always well dressed. He enjoyed a good movie, an outing. He was intelligent, enjoyed fun conversations, talked politics, life, philosophical musings. He loved photography, always taking photos, especially around the Paddington area. There are hundreds of photos taken around here in his earlier days. And there was always that warm sense of humor and gentle smile. If you, if you got to know Mirko, I think you will understand the person that I'm talking about. 
In terms of his character, he was quite charming, a very charming individual. He possessed reasoned intelligence, generous in spirit, emphatic, calm, reliable, competent, respectful, and not given to being unnecessarily intemperate. And he was also a very private, very private and unassuming man. The love of his life was his family and his close friends, which he cherished. But I can't go without mentioning the love of his life, which was also his vehicle, the car that personified his style and eloquence, which was the classic Citroen DS series. Now, he absolutely loved that vehicle. Technologically, it was the most advanced vehicle you could get on the road at the time. It was in production from 1955 to 1975. And he drove that car everywhere. He drove it everywhere, every day, for work, for play, for outings, excursions. Sadly, he had to give it up in 2001, as it no longer became serviceable, and his lifestyle had changed. In terms of his work beginnings, he had different jobs for a while. And when he moved to Sydney in 1957, he worked for the Aston Morris Motor Company as a mechanic. He then settled into uh, a job at the St. Regis, ACI St. Regis uh, factory, which is in 1958, which was located in Homebush. And he was working as an extrusion operator, working in the plastics industry for about 20 years. And it sounds like a simple job. In a few words, it probably does sound simple. It was actually quite complicated. In the field of his work, he wasn't just a factory mechanic in the plastics industry. In his latter work years, after about 1978, he extended into the supervisor project manager role. He assisted in training in the setup of a Chinese factory in their operations. He also set up a factory in, in Melbourne in their operations, and this was specifically related to his field, which was extrusion and plastics injection molding related to pipes and plastics packaging that you see every day. Unfortunately, uh, due to Milko's honest giving nature, and I'll quickly brush over this, but I don't want to dismiss this, in his latter work years, due to some health problems, he was effectively shunted out of his work because of politics and a changing market. And I don't think his uh, contribution to what he did and sustained in that specific organisation was fully acknowledged. I only mention this because when he did talk about work, and he spoke about his work, which was his life, he ended up in tears talking about the latter years of the, the jobs he did in, in China and the factory in Melbourne and the fact that, I, I don't know, something had happened there that, that wasn't right. And I didn't quite understand it until I saw the references that were detailed in their explanation of what he did. And I don't believe his contribution to their business was fully acknowledged. Anyway, they're out of business now, so it really doesn't matter. Mirko retired in April of 1994. Uh, soon after, in the same year, his wife Emma passed on on the 31st of August 1994. It was in 2001 that Mirko moved from the eastern suburbs in Cook Road to Penrith, and I consider this his retirement years because they were ostensibly his retirement years. In terms of his health, Mirko was diagnosed with diabetes in 1989. Can I tell you, he never really talked about it. He didn't come up to me and say, oh, by the way, son, I've got diabetes. He basically carried on with his medication, carried on with his life, and really didn't discuss it until I saw all these medications, and he said, oh, I'm just taking these medications, I need to take them. I didn't question him. He did put a bit of fear in me in the early stages, but I soon found out that that was unwarranted because he was actually a very gentle, a very lovely man. He managed his diabetes for many years, successfully, until about 2008 when the complications set in, and then in 2009 when the uh, severity of the disease started to kick in. He was losing his balance, he couldn't care for himself well enough, and he refused help. He was very stubborn, he was very proud in that Slavic sense. So there were a few occurrences of hospital stays in 2009. Then in August of the 1st of 2009, Mirko suffered a seizure in public. I believe it was a brain seizure of a type. There was help available. He was taken to hospital. He was diagnosed as not being able to care for himself after six weeks in hospital. And then he was admitted to the Governor Philip Nursing Home on September the 9th in 2009. It's a date that sticks in my head. Anyway, he had a very difficult start. But after he got over his admission and started to warm to the world and engage, 
Mirko endeared himself to almost everyone at the Governor Philip, staff and patients alike, and became a firm friend to many. He had a very cheeky outlook. He was very friendly. Isn't it nice to see the sun shining through the stained glass? Isn't that lovely? Doesn't that give you a warm sense? He was very friendly, engaging, and would discuss nearly all topic matter. Even in his confused state, he still knew who he was, who I was, where he was, and where he'd come from. He kept on keeping on as best as he could for a better part of two years, regardless of his immobility and his deteriorating health, and he just took each day as it came. And there were some teary days, and he was always thinking about home. He was always wondering about the relevance of his life and what it meant to others and where he came from. From February of this year, it was becoming clear that Mirko's life force was fading slowly at first, and then by April it was a real drop of energy and engagement from the once strong man I knew as his condition deteriorated. And that was hard to watch. On Wednesday, the 30th of May at 6.49 a.m., my life changed forever. After I got a call from the nursing home advising me that Mirko was unresponsive. Something had happened a week earlier on the 23rd. It was a false alarm. He was okay. He didn't look great, but he was still talking. And that's the last time I heard him say, hey, that's my son. As I arrived on the 30th of May, I noticed and I could see that he was gasping for breath. His eyes closed and I could see that his time had come. I spent the 30th of May with my father doing the best I could to comfort him and see him out on his next spiritual journey. I've never spoken as much or as so much in one 12 hour period as I did up until 10.15 p.m. on the 30th of May. I spoke to him about anything and everything related to our relationship, to our lives, to say, I care, and most of all, I love you, Dad. The day seemed to speed by in some kind of accelerated, surreal kind of time movement. His departure appeared, in a way, and I excuse the expression, like a bat out of hell, like he was making a hurried exit that could just be at any moment. The day was filled with phone calls, people dropping in, my anxiety, my fear, and knowing this was it. I reluctantly left to repose for the day as I need to gather my thoughts and my energy in my accommodation because I was not knowing how long this would go on for, if it would continue throughout the night or the next day. However, after an hour and a quarter of sleeping, my phone rang. The nursing home had told me that Mirko had passed away at around 1.13 a.m. on the 31st of May. My world stopped for me on that day. Everything looked the same, but I, by golly, it didn't feel the same. And while I would have liked to have been there for his final moments, in the end, I said to him, and I said everything that I possibly could to tell my father what a wonderful person he is, was, and to offer sincere words that he was loved by many, and not to be fearful of the event taking place, but to relax and know that peace and love awaits him in the next spiritual plane. I told Mirko many times that day that everyone he knew would be waiting for him, and I did what I could to help him on his journey as best I could. I know and I hope and I feel that he left feeling calm and not frightened. All day I said to Mirko, my father, Dad, you're in control now and you can leave any time you want. I hope I gave him the courage to face death and told him how much I and everyone who knew him valued him and there was nothing left to do but give words of strength while saying goodbye. I already greatly miss him and I'm beginning to see now and it's sinking in very gradually I can see the many invaluable life gifts that Mirko, my father, imparted to me and that I will be forever grateful to him for being my father until it is my time to pass over. I thank you.